there is a lot of beautiful recovering faces out there. That's all I gotta say. Um, are you thankful to be live this morning? Yes. All right, all right. Well, let's greet each other with the love of Christ. Someone maybe you have you don't know or haven't met. <laughs> closer near to us, God. As we need you in every minute, every second, every hour, every hour of our lives, God. Um, penetrate our hearts, our minds, our souls. Help us in this recovery process. And remind us that we're not alone, God. And that just in your presence, we can be healed. Give you all the praise and all the glory, glory that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, oh my soul. I worship his Oh 
my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending
All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All right, bigger now, stop. Thank you. 
But thank you for me being, being brave enough to do that. Yeah. All right, it's Father's Day. Wow. So, you know, God has an order with everything that he does. The world is in order. Families are in order. And God set the man to be the head of the household. Ladies, whether you like it or not, that's what it is. The man is the head. That's what it is. Now, here's what happens is sometimes, sometimes man will cause the woman to have to take that position. You know, life circumstances, something will happen in life to where the woman has to step to the plate and take that role. And God bless you women, whoever in this room you've had to do that before. I know I've had to do that before. And God bless us. He gives us grace and mercy and anointing to be able to do that. But that's not God's best plan. God's plan is man is the head of the household. It's just the way that it is. When man takes the leadership role in the house and he does it like Christ, everything works together the way it's supposed to work. It's amazing how smart God is. So... Men, you need to understand and you need to take your rightful position in your household. That's just the way it is. You have to learn how Christ did things. Christ loved the church. We're the church. And when Christ loves us, we naturally follow him and we love him. And men, that's what you do. You treat your household the way Christ did and everything will fall into place. And that's just the way it is. That's a side message. That's not the message that I have for you today. But that's something. Today, this morning has been an interesting morning. This weekend has been an interesting weekend. There has been many, 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 many problems. And I don't mean M-I-N-I. -I. Not M-I-N-I. -I. Not many problems. There has been many problems, even as recently as this morning. God gives us grace to handle problems, right? You have problems. Everybody has problems. God gives us grace. Genesis chapter 37. It's called the dreamer chapter because it's about a young man by the name of Joseph who was a dreamer. God gave him a dream. And Joseph was only 17 years old when we start this uh, message here. He was a boy. And I want to read some of this to you. And so stay with me. You promise you'll stay with me? Yeah. All right. Many times when scripture is read, people daze off into the ozone and they don't pay attention to what's going on. I will tell you this. Whenever you open up the word of God, and you're reading the Word of God, there is a message in there for you. And you got to pay attention. So before you start reading the Word of God, you say, okay, God, what is the message in here for me today? There's a message here for you out of Genesis 37. It says, Joseph was 17 years old. He was a boy. Now Israel, that's his father, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. There's so many lessons that we can learn just from that little message right there. There, um, shame on Israel, that's the father. We should say shame on him for showing Joseph more attention, more favor than his other sons. He had many other sons, and shame on him for doing that. How many of us know that, though? That's a natural thing that happens in families today. You know, the first child is a girl, the second child is a girl, and everybody wants a boy, and then the boy comes along, and guess what? Who becomes the favorite in the family? You know, and so it's kind of a natural course of action. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. How many times does that happen 
in a family. You have your, you know, the older sibling is calling the younger sibling names, and pretty soon all the siblings are fighting with each other. None of them are nice to each other. None of them can talk well about the other because they're jealous. It wasn't Joseph's fault that his father favored him, but that ugly spirit of jealousy festered in his brothers, and they hated him. How jealousy is a spirit. And I will tell you right now today that if you have jealousy in your heart, you better check yourself and you better figure out a way to get it out of your heart because it will destroy you. It brings anger and it brings hate. Their hearts wanted the same attention as Joseph. Now, Joseph had a dream. God gave Joseph this great dream. And he gives us dreams too, but here's the deal. Sometimes your dreams shouldn't just be shared right away. And that's where Joseph made his mistake. Here they are. They're sitting around the family dinner, having a family dinner. And here comes that little brat, Joseph, to the table. And he <laughs> tells his brothers, oh, I have a dream and you're all going to bow down to me. I mean, can you imagine? They already hated this kid, and now he's telling them that they're going to bow down to him. I mean, sometimes when we have a dream, we need to keep our big mouths shut and let God work with us. Now, his brothers went out to pasture the father's flock the next day. And Israel, the father, said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Now here's the picture. How many times do you watch other people go out and go to work, or many times you have older siblings and they're out cleaning the house and you're sitting in front of the television texting and not doing anything. That's what happened here. Joseph was sitting in the living room watching TV, texting, and his brothers, all of his older brothers are out working. They're out in the flock. And the father said to this kid, where are your brothers? Aren't they out tending to the flock? And he's trying to get this 17-year-old spoiled brat to grow up. And he said, get up. I want you to get up. I want you to go to your brothers. I want you to go check on your brothers. I want you to tell me and come back and tell me if they're doing okay. So this kid did. He got up and he went out to find his brothers. And his brothers didn't know that he was coming. And all of a sudden, they see this kid from afar off. Well, how could they see him from so far away? Because this father had made this kid a special coat of many colors. And this kid was antagonizing his brothers. He wore this coat everywhere he went could be 90 degrees out, and this kid had on a very special coat that his father made for him as a gift. And so here they are, they're tending the sheep, they're, they're looking, they're working hard, and they see this kid out there, and the reason they could see him is because of all of the purple and orange, and it was kind of looked like my coat does today. It was a coat of many colors. And that's how they recognized that it was him that was coming. And as this kid was walking towards them, the brothers were conspiring to kill him. They hated him so badly that they said, when he gets here, let's just kill him. And we'll tell our dad that some wild animal ate him. This is how much they hated him. So here comes Joseph, he's coming up upon them, he's doing what his father told him to do, and all of a sudden the brothers were going to kill him. But Reuben, who was the oldest brother, said, no, no, let's don't shed any blood, let's don't kill him, but let's take him and we're going to throw him into a pit, and then we'll just see what happens from there. And that's what they did. Reuben saved the younger brother, but yet they put him in a pit. And this pit was deep, and it did not have water in it. But there was no way for Joseph to get out of the pit. How many here today are in a pit? How many of you today feel like you are stuck? You are in a cold, dark, 
smelly, moldy, stenchy pit, and you don't know how to get out. You don't have the rope to climb out of the pit. You're in a pit. Maybe you're in a pit of depression today. Maybe you're in a pit of worry today. Maybe you're in a pit of anxiety today. Maybe you're in a pit of poverty today. You don't have enough money. You don't know what you're going to do to get out of the pit. But can you imagine this story should have been on true crimes, you know? This kid was only 17 years old. And the rage of jealousy, that, je that spirit of jealousy drove his brothers to want to kill him. Now, I know many of you in this room have been raised in a family of jealousy and things like that. But has it ever been to the point of where somebody wanted to murder you? His brothers threw him in a pit. They stole his coat of many colors. When he got there, they ripped that coat right off of him. They were so upset with him, and they threw him in the pit. Can you imagine Joseph in the pit? He's crying. He's going, well, this is probably just another one of those pranks that my brothers have played on me before. Everything will be okay. But then he was there hour after hour after hour. He was probably getting scared. Nobody's coming to get him out of the pit. What is he going to do? He was thinking, why is this happening to me? How many of you thought that? You get through a period where you're in a, a pit, you're in a bad spot, and you go, well, why is this happening to me? What have I done to deserve this? Why do we get in a pit and how do we get out of it? How did you get in the position that you are in today? Now here's a clue. It's a wise thing when we do a little self-inventory, when we start evaluating ourselves enough to know how is it that I got to this place? What have I done in my life to cause me to be where I am today? Now listen, I don't mean bringing on condemnation. That's a totally different subject. That's not what I'm talking about. Condemnation is heavy. Condemnation has no way out. If you are condemned, you don't have a way out. I'm talking about soul searching. I'm talking about asking God to search your heart. Search my heart, O oh Lord, so that I can come clean. Know my thoughts, God. I'm talking about soul searching. Why are you where you are today? Joseph could have easily said, it's not me, God. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just 17 years old. I just did what my dad told me to do. After all, it's these brothers. They're the ones that are all jealous. You know, he's blaming somebody else. You know, all we do that all the time. We say, well, all I did was, well, all I said was, we get in an argument, we go, well, all I said was, no, it's not all you said. What have you done to get where you are at today? When we go through difficulties, we always blame somebody else, don't we? It's natural. Well, so-and-so did that. After all, if my dad had not treated me the way that he did when I was a little girl, I wouldn't be where I am today. If my ex had treated me better, if he had just worked harder, I wouldn't be where I am today. We blame other people. We blame the President of the United States for making wrong choices. Instead, we ought to be praying for him. He's in a position for some reason. God has him there. Why don't we start praying for him instead of blaming him? You know, we blame him for all the wrong choices. You know, well, maybe it's our fault. Maybe we need to be praying for him instead of criticizing all the time. So I know you all have problems. I know you have hurts from your past. I know you've been through some stuff, but here's some real godly advice. Here's some real prophetic word for you today. Are you ready? Are you listening? All right, here it is. Get over it. I say that, and I know it's hard. I get it. But listen to me, if you don't get over it, you're just dragging along a bag of old stinky poo. You know, you put it in a big black bag, you carry it over your shoulder, and you just drag it through life. 
and then you add to it a little bit and you drag it some more and then you add to it a little bit and you drag it some more and the more that you drag around the stinky poo the heavier your life is going to be you're going to feel sorry for yourself you're going to not get over that anger listen to me if you have a spirit of anger in you you better start wiping that out of you real quick because you are going to get in trouble but we live in a society that is so quick to criticize, so quick to blame somebody else. That's why there's so many lawsuits going on all the time because, well, you know, somebody falls down or something, well, I'm going to sue you now. You know, in property management, I used to manage lots of, of medical office buildings, and I can't tell you how many lawsuits we would have every year from somebody slipping on the ice or in the snow while they were walking to the front door of the building and they turn around and sue you over it. You know, well stop wearing your high heels when it's snowing outside. You know, then maybe you won't fall down anymore. But you know, we live in a society that likes to sue and we like to blame. We like to complain. We complain about this and we complain about that. We complain about how we've been treated and, and we can cry over our spilled milk. But listen, it's not the action that puts us in the pit. It's not the action, it's our reaction to the problem. You know, if you're in a position today where you're in a dispute, you're not quite happy with where you work, you're not quite happy with where you live, check yourself out. Maybe it's not the other person that has the problem, maybe it's your reaction to the problem that is the problem, and we need to check ourselves out. Listen, his brothers hated him, and why did Joseph, now I'm asking the question, I don't know, why did Joseph never stop to think about what he was, why he was not liked by his brothers? He never stopped to think about why he was, he was the favorite one. He was the one of the many, you know, colors, the coat of many colors. He never asked himself why his brothers hated him. Why did he never stop to think about what he was doing that caused the problems in his family? I mean, how many of you know that many times there's one person in a family that we give all power and control to, and they get to do whatever they want, and the rest of us have to watch that? I don't think that's right. Why was Joseph not with his brothers when they went out to tend to the flocks in the field? Why was he not there? He was 17 years old. He was old enough to go and help. He didn't even get up and go try to help them. And the father told him, the father said, you go and help the brothers. Well, i got to tell you, nine of his brothers were in their 20s and 30s, and the other couple of brothers were probably in their 40s. They didn't need no 17-year-old kid to come and, and help them. But maybe the father wanted Joseph to go out there to teach him how to rekindle relationship. They, he wanted him to grow up. He wanted him to know what it was to work. The brothers did not even know that he was coming. The Bible said that they saw him from afar off, and it was because of that blasted coat of colors. <laughs> Every time you read the Bible, you need to think, what are you trying to say to me through this? Uh, you have your father's favor. He had his father's favor. You have your father's favor. And your father has given you a gift. Your father has given you a dream. How many believers are just so proud of their gift that they lose the fact or they take their eyes off of the gift giver? And that's what Joseph did. Joseph lost his gift. The father didn't take away the gift. He lost his gift. You know, we've had so many ministries that... Uh, uh, Men and women of God, they love God, they have been anointed to do the work of God, and they have lost their gift. They have lost their gift. They have lost their integrity. Listen, one of the most things that you can hang on to is your integrity. It is a gift, but you get so full of pride. Joseph lost his gift because he was so full of pride. 
I can just see him with that coat of colors around his brother going, oh, na 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 na, look at me, I get the coat of colors. You know, he's full of pride. We get full of pride instead of being thankful for our gift. We just need to thank God for our gift. You might say, well, I don't have a gift. Yes, you do. Everybody has a gift. When we get into the pit, we lose sight of all of the favor and we lose sight of everything that we have been given. We, when, even when we're in the pit, we need to make a gratitude list. You not, might be in the pit today. Maybe you only have one thing that you can think of that you're grateful for. Write it down and remember it and be thankful for the one thing. What we do is we focus on all of the things we don't have. Joseph lost his gift. It was taken away. And you say, well, can I lose my gift? What if my gift is taken away? Well, the end of the story with Joseph is God did not only restore his gift, but he gave him double for his trouble. And he will do the same thing with you today. God fulfilled the destiny for Joseph. He ended up being the governor of Egypt and a leader in the land. And he will do the same thing for you. But when we are in the pit, we need to seek God's perspective first instead of our own. We need to listen to God first. When we're in the pit, Satan will immediately come to you and he will condemn us. God will bring conviction to our heart, but God will never, ever condemn you. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Now, hear me and listen to me. Conviction shows us something. Conviction teaches us something. Conviction tells us that we fell short in an area or something like that. It's trying to teach us something. Condemnation is from that enemy of yours called Satan. It is not from God. In John 3.17 it says, God did not send us his son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent him to save us. God will never ever condemn you. We need God's perspective and we need to stop listening to the voice of Satan. He is such a good and perfect liar that he even fabricates evidence to back his lies up. That's what fear means, F-E-A-R. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Satan will do the same thing to you. He will say, you're, just, you're not going to be healed. <laughs> Look, did you not hear what the doctor said? That's what he's bringing false evidence. The Bible says you were healed. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to Satan? Who says, oh, uh, you're not healed after all. You don't feel good. Look at your body. Look at all the symptoms in your body. You don't feel good. That is false evidence appearing to be real. He says, well, you're going to get fired. After all, you made that huge mistake at work. Fear. False evidence appearing. Con condemnation. Condemnation says that you are a bad person. Condemnation says you will never do anything right. Condemnation says that you are in a pit and you have no way of getting out of the pit. You know, condemnation says, well, you know, you're married to the wrong person. That's one of Satan's number one things. He goes, you're married to the wrong person. After all, you two don't have anything in common. You're totally opposite. Listen, why would we want to marry somebody like ourselves? We should marry somebody totally opposite. If I was married to somebody just like me, I'd probably kill myself. You know? We don't listen to your enemy. We need to listen to the power of the hope. Get God's perspective, not yours. The purpose of every pit, and this is every, every single pit that you are in, the purpose of the pit is to get you to cry out to God. What else is there to do in a pit? What else can you do? Joseph was in the pit. What was he going to do? I can just imagine when he was first put in the pit, he was probably going, well, God, it wasn't my fault. It's these brothers of mine. They're so envious and jealous of everything that I do. I'm sure that it's them. 
and then he thought he might get out of the pit a little bit sooner, but he was stuck in the pit. He was there for a long period of time. And after he'd been there for a long period of time, can you imagine? He probably sat down on his knees and he started to cry and, and he was going, oh, God, maybe it was me after all. God, maybe I caused this whole thing to happen. But God, forgive me, God, maybe it is my fault. And it's for the purpose of the pit is to get us to wake up, to get us to cry out to God. God the Father who can heal us, God the Father who can renew us, God the Father that can restore our soul, God the Father that gives us mercy and grace wherever we go. You know, when we're in a little bit of a pit, it's easy for us to get out of. We don't even think about God. But it's when we're in the big pit, when we don't have enough money to pay our bills. That's a big pit. You know, and then it's our boss's fault. Well, if that boss of mine would just pay me more money, I wouldn't be in this pit. Well, no. Your boss is not your God. You need to look to God who says, I give you the power to get well. And we got to stop complaining. We have to stop judging. We have to learn how to do the right thing. Now, I'll tell you right now, if you're sick in the room today, you need to cry out to Jesus. He promised to heal you. Why are you taking that sickness and disease on? You don't, have, you don't need to take that on. You talk to that thing. That is a mountain in your life, and you tell that thing to go away. We complain. We lose sight of the answer. The answer for every problem, the answer for every pit is Jesus Christ. He will heal your body. He will give you wealth. He gave Joseph double for his trouble. I think that when Joseph realized that the reason he was in the pit wasn't just because of his brothers, when he realized that, all of a sudden, somebody came and lifted him up out of the pit. He, lay, he got lifted out of the pit. Sometimes we need people to lift us out of the pit. Sometimes we need somebody to just come up to us and say, knock it off. Not you knock that off. Sometimes that's all we need. Somebody just to tell us to knock it off. It sparks us. It causes us to go, yeah, maybe they're right. Maybe I need to get up out of bed and stop feeling sorry for myself. Maybe I need to go to work and then I would have money. Maybe I need to change my life and do stuff a little bit differently. You know, when Chris was a teenager, he came to me and he asked me if he could drive a car. And I said, well, Chris, I, I tell you what I'll do. If, if you get your grades up and if you start reading the Bible and if you cut your hair, I might let you drive the car. So a month goes by and he comes back again and I said, well, Chris, I did notice that you have started to read the Bible and... Your grades have come up a lot, good for you, but you still haven't cut your hair. And he said, well, yeah, but mom, you know what? Abraham had long hair, and Moses had long hair, and Jesus had long hair. Jesus had long hair. I said, well, Chris, that's a really good point, and they walked everywhere they went. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to show you this. This is so hilarious. It's not it's prophetic is what it is. You talk about, this is prophetic, and I'm telling you that this could happen at any moment. I don't know if you can all see this or not, but here up at the top it says the Hyatt Regency, and in the black it says, be 
ready outside at the pickup point. And if you read down here to the bottom, it says Jesus is on the way. Arrival one minute. <laughs> <laughs> now this, this is a real deal. This is real. Do y'all see? This is real. This is real. How did we get me? This is like was it an Uber? Or was it Lyft? Uber. 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 <laughs> Be ready outside at the pickup point. The arrival is one minute, and Jesus is on the way. Now, I just have to tell you, you need to be ready. Be ready at the pickup point. Where's the pickup point? we got to be ready. We have, because Jesus is on the way. Jesus is on the way. And there is a pickup point. And the pickup point is when you have Jesus in your heart. You're born again. You've received him as your Lord and Savior. That's the pickup point. And he could come in one minute. When, are you prepared for that? In one minute. Man, I'd like to be gone in one minute. I'm ready to go. I'm ready. I'm I'm out of here. You know, he comes and here I am. You know, forgive us of our sins, Father God, because we are all sinners. We all fall short of your your purpose, Father God. And I thank you, Lord God, today that you bless us. I thank you, Father, today that you heal our bodies. I thank you today, Father God, that you forgive our sins, for they are many. That you take away our iniquities, Father. That you teach us, Lord, a better way. A better way to walk with you, Father God. I thank you today, God, that you bless us. That you show us how we can get wealth so that we can give back to others like you have given to us, Father. That, Father, that you show us what your purpose is, Lord God. That you will help us, Father God. That you will fulfill the destiny, Lord, that you have for our life. A destiny of beauty. A destiny of power. A destiny to f help fulfill your mission, Father God. That we can bring others into the kingdom of God in these last days, Father God. I thank you that you cover us. And I thank you, Father God, most of all, that you love us. And that you teach us, Father God, how to love you and how to love one another. I say happy Father's Day to all you fathers that you're so blessed to be a father. Whether you're separated from your children or not, you are still blessed to be a father. Because why? Because he has given you the power of prayer. And there is no distance in your prayers so even if you are separated from your children today, fathers, I ask that you pray for them today because that's the best thing that you can do for them, that you cover them with the blood of Christ and that you pray that God will fulfill the destiny that he has for your children. And I also pray that you will pray for restoration. That God is a God that restores families together, no matter how far you've been separated or how far you think your relationship is lost. I pray that you pray that it will be restored. And men in the room and fathers in the room, you have to understand that your prayers are heard immediately by your Father in heaven. He hears you instantly. And he knows that you are the leader of your family and of your businesses and, and over your children. And he will be faithful and just to answer all of your prayers. Our problem is, is we don't pray enough. We just don't pray enough. And we need to come together in prayer always, every minute of every day. We need to have a spirit of prayer always within us. In Jesus' name. So, um, who has a prayer request? Did Shay have that song? Okay. Who has a prayer request? And we might play a, a song if Shay can find it really quick. We got five minutes left. 
so don't get all panicky. We're, we're still good. I always watch the clock to make sure I'm on time. I'm never early and I'm never late. Isn't that right, Dick? <laughs> yes. Mary, this morning, Roger lost her father at about 2 a.m. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, Roger. Like this family and yes. Thank you. Thank you. And here you are in church. You're a brave soul. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Yes. at the Salvation Army, the Denver ARC, which is closing August 1st. We know that uh, God provides them, that the community comes forward and right. does what they can for people, that they find the treatment in the house and that they need. Yes. I know we need money, Bill, so we can expand. I mean, I don't know what's happening. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Demetrius. Uh, the, the alumni of the Salvation Army site that will reach out to the paintings there at the Salvation Army to lend a half a hand so let them know that this works, that the program works. Yes. Right, thank you. Yes. Okay. She was here this week, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pray for my dad. He just got out of a uh, psych ward and he's uh, super depressed and um, suicidal and I just pray that he finds his way back to church and happiness and all that Thank good you. stuff. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Any other prayer requests? Yes. Uh, our children. Yes, thank you. Okay. Other prayer requests? All right, we're going to stand and pray, but are we ready on that? So this is a real special song, and this is a song that Shay's father sang, and we just want to listen to it real quick, and then we will pray. Here we are. All together, here we are, side by side, here we are, with each other, let's all sing a fan. Oh, uh -huh. 